Hello, opera lovers. Jonathan Dean here, Seattle Opera Dramaturg with Quarantine Hair. And I'm here today to talk to you about a topic I find particularly fascinating, motifs from Mozart to movies. A nice alliterative title and showing, I think, the level of nerdiness that we're getting into with this particular topic. Uh, motifs, musical storytelling in opera and then, of course, in opera's descendant, uh, cinema. Motifs are extraordinarily powerful uh, storytelling tools. What is a motif? A motif is just a musical idea that becomes sort of a tag or somehow gets a stuck like a post-it on some element of your story, whether that's an opera or a movie. Some character or prop or place or idea or feeling or all of the above. Example, here's a four-note motif that tells you a lot. <laughs> Right, only four notes. You heard it twice right there, and you already know what kind of movie we're in, what the character is like, how, I mean, whoever is the, whoever the actor is playing James Bond at this point, we, we already have a lot to go with. Another one, uh, a, um, not a franchise, but uh, eight notes that give you, again, a, an enormous amount of information about one particular movie's interpretation of a character who does exist beyond that particular movie. <laughs> So yeah, just all of that, all of that richness, that power, that majesty, the music tells you as much as, say, the poster image starring Peter O'Toole as Lawrence of Arabia. They're heading off into the sunset and those amazing David Lean scapes. The music is a major part of the storytelling going on in these forms. The movies got it from opera. Where did opera get it from? Well, opera... I mean, it had been doing it for a while. The, the the origin of it is a little bit lost in the dim mists of the past. It got more complicated, and different operas from different periods do it quite differently. Before we get too much into the nitty-gritties and the specifics, a, 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 the first of two user uh, warnings, buyer beware, uh, when you have a fantastic piece of music and it's a fabric woven from a whole lot of these recurring little motivic ideas, think of it, well, like you might in uh, the visual arts of a textile where there's recurring ideas that appear again and again and again. Now, you can drop to your knees and pull out your magnifying glass and scrutinize it very, very closely, which is what I'm going to do here and what you'll probably hear a lot of musicians doing when they're talking about their favorite film scores or their favorite opera scores. But you also can, it can be just a carpet and you're allowed to to be just like, oh, that's fantastic, and I think it's uh, beautiful, and I respect the artistry that it went into it, and I don't need to know the details. Or you can just walk right across it and go into the room. Um, you can so all all these things are perfectly acceptable ways of using it. Uh, it does take a, a rather obsessive genius artist to come up with this uh, on an operatic scale. The first one to do it on a uh, in a big way was Mozart, who's of course kind of the father of modern opera. Um, examples from Mozart of where music returns over the course of an opera uh, with some kind of significance. And with Mozart, it's actually not as it later became so specifically about characters or this or that or the other thing. And a lot of the time with Mozart, the music comes back to sort of beat you over the head with a sledgehammer. This is the point of the opera. Here's an example. Mozart's uh, beloved opera, Don Giovanni, opens with a little bit of music that will come back later on. This uh, rather dire music for what's called a drama giocoso or a joking drama starts like this. <laughs> And you hear that little tread there, that dun, 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 dun. That is the steps of the inexorable avenger coming to punish sin. Don Giovanni has a subtitle. Not everybody uh, knows this. Don Giovanni or Il Dissoluto Punito, the dissolute man punished. 
It is a story of sin and punishment, and that music is telling us that from the very, very get-going. And of course, that's even before any of the characters have come on stage. Later, at the end of the opera, when D D Divine Vengeance actually shows up, when the statue bursts into Don Giovanni's house where he's having this kind of orgy dinner party, sure enough, we get that same music back again, and that same inexorable tread, and, and probably musically, j in the theater, just goes right to your subconscious, because you're so distracted by the fact that a wall just got knocked over and the statue is talking and singing and there's special effects you can hear uh, in addition to the more intense chords that Mozart gives us um, our special effects guy has added some extra sound of his own to go with all of the the craziness that's happening on stage. And the strings have started that dom, 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 that, that tread, that step. And again, I don't think anybody's actually paying attention to that, picking up on that, because we're listening to the voice of the bass, and oh my god, it's a statue, and he can sing, and this is kind of scary, and all, but it's also kind of awesome. That's a little example of a recurring musical motif in Mozart. I want to talk a little bit about, I can't not talk about the master of the motif, Richard Wagner, um, who did a lot of things to opera, kind of turned the whole art form inside out and on its head. But one of Wagner's big pioneering steps was to find more possibilities more ways to use the motif. Wagner's the one who took it from being just the motif where tune recurs to the light motif where the tune recurs subtly different and changing and leading us through the entire story as he goes. Example, as quickly as possible. How does that work? Here's a Wagner motif for a Wagner character, Parsifal, the tenor protagonist of his last opera, and he's got this neat little jaunty tune. Here it is. It's basically seven notes. Dun, 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 dun. When he first bounds on stage, it sounds like this. Well, you'll be amazed where Wagner puts this tune to by the course of what's actually admittedly kind of a longish opera, the story of this young fool made wise by compassion. In Act 2, he is flirting with all these gorgeous flower maidens at the castle of the evil wizard, and he's, his motif goes flirty. <laughs> You tell me what's happening to Parsifal when his motif sounds like this. Weariness of body, sure, but maybe of soul as well. Maybe that's despair or the as close as he's going to get to it. He doesn't, in fact, despair. The opera has a, happy, or a positive conclusion, and here's how Parsifal's motif sounds at the end. So you see what I mean? The uh, evolution of just one little tune over the course of an opera that's actually got a lot of these other themes going on at the same time. In The Ring Cycle, Wagner's great opera franchise, it gets so dizzyingly complicated we sometimes end up with what I like to call motif soup. I'm going to play you a little bit of music from The Ring, and this is from very early on, so you're, you're sort of amazed that he's got this many themes going at the same time. This is a little bit of scene change music between the second and third scene of the first opera of The Ring, Das Rheingold. And now, you, here's my second by beware user warning you really shouldn't put labels on your motifs when you give them names that encourages your brain to think you've solved it and that all you need to know is those six notes or whatever is the blah 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 motif well no that's just the tip of the iceberg you still need to go so what does that mean why is that element of this story worthy of getting its own little musical tag and why that music for that thing and that's when it starts getting really, really, really interesting. Anyways, um, that's for the 2.0 version of this talk. What I wanted to do is just give you a little tour through this, this little scene change. And I've, I've labeled some of these, even though I just told you not to label them. It's hard to talk about them if you don't have labels. Um, uh, you'll notice in this little passage of just like a minute of music, you'll hear, I'm going to move myself out of the way 
if I can. Ah, yeah. Um, the little uh, fiery music for the fire god Loga, the sad music of the renunciation of love, this pain motif of Veya, Veya, Veya. And then Freya. Now, Freya is the love goddess. She's just been kidnapped by the two giants, Fasold and Fafner, who are dragging her off to. Uh, the, so she's in great distress. And the music is. It's going to go uh, d uh, tumble with her for a little bit until we get to the Rheingold, the ring, and then the Nibelungs. The gods, uh, Wotan and Loga, are going down to Nibelheim in order to get the ring that the Nibelung made from from the Rheingold that he stole in order to ransom Freya. So that's where we are in this complicated plot, and the music tells us all of that in this fantastic and rather quick little passage. So yeah, Wagner changed, he, he showed us a lot more possibilities for musical storytelling, and he delivered all that to the composers of the 20th century through the real gateway into the movie composer sort of industry was Giacomo Puccini. So I'm going to go ahead and give you one more example of an opera motif and its ramifications. And this is from Puccini's Tosca. Let's look at the uh, motif for Baron Scarpia, who is our bad guy and who is also the figure that really, he dominates the drama and his music dominates the uh, musical score from the get-go, from the very, very first notes of the opera, which are a motif associated with Scarpia. Sounds like this, and there's the sheet music for it. Hope you, you can see that. In fact, let me get myself out of the way. Uh, yeah. Um, yes. So how do we know that that's a Scarpia motif? Well, one real important clue is they play it really loud the first time he comes on stage. But halfway through Act 1, we're in this church scene. All the altar boys are really excited because they've just heard there's going to be a party that night. They're all bouncing around. Confetti is The sacristan has everything out of control. And in comes Scarpia. He's leading a whole bunch of police. And his line, Un tal bacano in chiesa bel rispetto. Such an orgy in church show some respect. His motif introduces his entrance, and I want you to think about that line as you listen to this motif. So having him uh, enter with that is a pretty good clue that this music is associated, that's the tag associated with the character. That's his music. He, it's like a leitmotif. Sometimes it's fast when he's really, really angry and about ready to slap someone. <laughs> It's slow. That's when he's dead, lying there with a, a 
crucifix on his chest and candelabras on either side of him, and he's still dominating the music, and he does go on to dominate the whole show even after his death, and the last line of the opera is Tosca killing herself and saying, Scarpia, you and I are going to have this battle in the next life, Scarpia, before God, because death will not stop this man from, as I say, wanting to have both sides of it. One more little example of this, the brilliant, brilliant, brilliant dramatic use of this motif. Here's a moment from Act 2 where Scarpia is basically offering Tosca a decision. You can either have sex with me or watch your tenor boyfriend, Mario Cavardossi, die. Which are you going to choose? And she's kind of wavering between them, and of course the music is wavering through the two un, un, incompatible choices of the Scarpia motif. <laughs> Aspetta! Again, a musical device providing organic unity, providing, I think at this point, somewhere subliminally, it's just helping us figure out what, where we are in the drama in this excruciating moment of tension. Great, 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 great use of motifs. And, of course, Puccini did, in fact, um, because was the most popular opera composer of the world at the time that they started uh, hooking up music to picture when they invented the talkies. Now, um, uh, movie music, I do wanted to um, give you, of course, you can't, it's hard, you can't talk about it without talking about John Williams, who's got so many fantastic, fantastic movie franchises. I want to play you a little moment from a, a John Williams movie. Here's a little bit from, it's the third of the Indiana Jones movies, and at this point, Indiana Jones is, and his uh, lady friend have just managed to uh, break through the uh, floor of this c uh, church in Venice, and they're on the hunt for the, the clues that'll lead them to the Holy Grail. And we remember the object of the quest in the first movie. What's this one? The Ark of the Covenant. Are you sure? Pretty sure. What makes you so sure, Dr. Jones? Well, of course, he heard the motif playing there. Very, very, you know, eerie from the movie number one. So uh, kind of a, um, a silly little uh, in-joke moment there for John Williams, but it's okay because he's given us so much gl glorious pleasure with the rest of those, uh, all the music that he's done in all those movies. I wanted to actually give you uh, some examples from the movie franchise that to me is the one to set kind of next to the creation of Richard Wagner. Howard Shore's music for The Lord of the Rings. Um, those were wonderful movies. I understand they're going to be making some new ones. Um, uh, but going back to these, these, the scores are what, to me, make those movies so spectacular. Here's a little example of a Wagnerian leitmotif where the tune evolves over the course of the thing. The music that Shore wrote for the Elves of Lothlorien. So if you remember in movie number one, um, the heroes, the protagonists have all made it through this very, very stressful situation in the Caves of Moria. And they go to this um, kind of spooky wood forest where the elves are. And it's very unearthly. And it's not immediately threatening, but they don't feel comfortable there and Shore gives it this wonderful little musical illustration of the other world sitar that he's using there. Anyways, so that's set up for those characters, the, that particular um, world, that particular uh, community. They all show up midway through the battle sequence at the end of the next movie, The Two Towers, uh, as the, like, just enough people, maybe we won't lose this battle entirely at the Helm's Deep sequence. And their music has now turned into a war march. That was one where a lot of the purists got all kind of funny about it because, of course, that story that is, doesn't happen in the book quite like that. In the movie, it actually seems to me that it actually it works pretty well, but I think it's because the music is selling it so brilliantly, both in terms of the emotion of the scene and also that musical connection to what we have heard before, what we've already built up. Got one more ex little example from Lord of the Rings to share with you, and this is from the final movie there, The Return of the King. And again, how does Mozart start using these things originally back in the 18th century? 
what's to give us the point. What is this story about? What is the Lord of the Rings about? J.R.R. Tolkien said it was about death. Here's a little musical motif that we hear very, very prominently at the very end of The Return of the King in the credits, uh, the song that won the Academy Award that year for Best Score, um, Into the West, sung by Annie Lennox. Again, just four notes, but they set up that what is, when they get on that boat and they're heading off into the West, where are they go? Where's What's over there? I don't know, but this is what it sounds like. Across the sea. Again, little sort of four note, maybe an eight note motif there. Uh, this fantastically powerful image of that alluring thing that lies beyond where Scarpia and Tosca are finally going to have it out on that land on the other side of death. Now, um, here's the, the brilliance, the beauty, and sometimes the simplicity and the subtlety of musical storytelling with motifs. I'm going to play you a little bit, just n not the, the movie, but the, so I want, because I want you to focus on the use of music. The little dialogue in the scene in the third movie between Gandalf and Pippin, right when, like, they've just lost. There's no no hope left and Pippin is our young hobbit who doesn't hasn't necessarily found all of his courage and he doesn't um, know how he's gonna survive the next couple minutes or he's not gonna survive the next couple minutes what it's gonna be like and Gandalf the older wiser character has some words of comfort from him which come from Tolkien's book um, spoken beautifully by uh, Ian, Sir Ian McKellen in the role of Gandalf to Billy Boyd as Pippin listen to Howard Shore's contribution death is just another path one that we all must take. The grey rain curtain of this world rolls back and all turns to silver glass. And then you see it. What? And else? See what? White shores. And beyond. Far green country and a swift sunrise. As I say, you don't have to bash us over a head with a sledgehammer to get your motifs to make their point. We've heard some that kind of work like that, but a lot of them are much, much, much more subtle and probably slip right into your subconscious as you're listening, as you're following the story, as you're following the interactions of the characters. But what a great tool. Thank you, opera composers, for giving that to our movie makers. And thank you, all of you, for your support of and your interest in Seattle Opera. We've got lots more content coming your way. Look forward to sharing a lot of our greatest singers in recital with you that's uh, just been announced and also tune in to king fm on saturday mornings for seattle opera mornings on king fm some of our greatest performances thanks so much for joining me today